Okay, thank you. I'd now like to introduce our, our second speaker, um, Honourable Minister Tuatama. Uh, he's the Minister of Health for Samoa. Um, he has a background as a medical practitioner, an advocate and a politician. His major interest has been in, particularly in obesity and lack of physical activity, both in his work as a physician and through his official duties, first as Associate Minister of Health in Samoa from 2006 to 2010 and then as Minister of Health uh, since 2011. He's represented Samoa at many international meetings, um, for example, uh, the United Nations General Assembly on the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases in New York in 2011. A non-communicable disease in the Pacific uh, region has been described as a, a tsunami of, of disease and it forces us to address some of the upstream issues in, in public health, um, including issues such as trade and economic policies, which are so important within, within the Pacific. The Pacific countries have much to teach us here in New Zealand in their development of comprehensive plans addressing non-communicable diseases, and we look forward to hearing from uh, Minister Tuatama on the issues challenging Pacific children and progress in facing those challenges. Introduce Minister Tuatama. I wish to first of all thank the Tangata Fenua Maori for the very warm welcome. I was very touched this morning by the ceremonious, uh, dignified uh, welcome. Uh, we also in Samoa, when we come here, we feel warm and comfortable in the knowledge that we also have uh, connections to Tatanaka, Fenua, Maori. <coughs> we are still asking questions at home about Tupi and Rata and Maori who left Samoa many years ago <laughs> to come to Aotearoa. Uh, we do believe that some of their descendants are among us today. I feel very at home being here. The bar picked here to Lona, to Lona. Before I uh, before I uh, say anything more about uh, my uh, application for this morning, I would like to first of all. Uh, to pay tribute to the hospitality given to us since we arrived. It is according to our customs that we should respond accordingly. So this morning, uh, just as a token of our appreciation to Otako and uh, Wellington, Victoria Universities, please accept this small token of uh, appreciation and for Taco University and for Victoria University. The Victoria campuses. Yeah. 
Secondly, a slightly bigger version of what has been given out already. The New Zealand Public Health Association. Please accept this <laughs> as a mark. Our brothers cannot be forgotten. The Maori caucus, please accept this as a mark of our respect and also our gratitude for taking care of us since we arrived here. <laughs> and finally, according to the custom, the Kaumatua Peter spoke on our behalf. It, he, he was our orator this morning to respond to the welcome. It's just a small uh, gift for you. Thank you very much. Opa ia mama malu ole neyasu. Malefono sui falabu tonga or sui fua malo no ina lautele in New Zealand. Ole a fatalolo. I fatulu watu yo fanua mo tapu a fanua. Ona ole fatawang fau. I tapu ele ele or tangata fenua maori. Too low, too low na lava. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to first of all thank the Dean and Head of the Campus, University of Otaku Wellington, and the Pacific Health Association of New Zealand for inviting me as one of the guest speakers in your meeting. I am privileged to be amongst the learned colleagues tasked with this responsibility. Thank you for the inclusion of the Samoa Minister of Health in your program. Equity from the start, valuing our children. As a cons conference theme, it is commendable. It is clearly in line with the equity principle of primary health care and indeed an example of practically translating our global, national, and individual duties for the promotion and implementation of the Convention on the Rights of a Child, or CRC. Most of us in public health work know primary health care like the palm of our hands. Not many know and understand the Convention on the Rights of a Child. Yet, CRC, or Convention on the Rights of a Child, is one United Nations framework that is so strongly aligned to our health work. It demands adults parents, guardians, and even health service providers to bring up, guide, and nurture children according to our respective context. All children, despite color, ethnic background, and religious affiliation, have the basic right to life. We understand that despite your developed world status, you are in a way still faced with communicable diseases and the public health concerns with the double burden of diseases is also your take. Valuing health with the health of children in the forefront was the basis 
of the Pacific countries' ministers of health, visionary in the Anuka Islands Declaration on Healthy Islands, which stated in 1995 that healthy islands are places where children are nurtured in body, mind, and spirit. Environments invite learning and leisure. People work and age with dignity. Ecological balance is a source and pride. And the ocean around us is protected for future generations. The value put on children is unquestionable, and when the health minister's vision is aligned to the typical health jargon, then it is simply about maternal child health, mental health, lifestyle and its related issues, environmental health, and climate change. Some critics have called this vision as poetic, unrealistic, and undoable. Some critics, yet the Pacific Island countries have remained loyal to their leaders' vision and application. After a decade of trial and error, this vision has proven its unique and appropriate pacificness. As a result, Healthy Islands has now been visualized, revitalized by the WHO and Pacific Island country health leaders as the strategic areas for health in the Pacific. Naturally, there are questions on how Pacific Islands are practically translating these strategic areas to improve the health of Pacific people. Samoa, for one, almost always work on understanding the ideas that underpin frameworks like the health minister's vision on healthy islands. Everything else follows. I know that as a public health professional, could write books on what you do in public health if asked the same question. We can too from the Pacific Island country perspective. Without a doubt, the common theme in our stories would be the application of the Alma Ata Declaration in, on Primary Health Care 1978 and the Ottawa Charter on Health Promotion 1986 to address maternal child health, mental health, non-communicable diseases and communicable, communicable diseases. Whilst you sing the praises of your Caucasian, Maori and New Zealand Pacific Island models of health, we would be, we would be talking about Ainga Manu Manuia, our family and village well-being approach, our village women's committee efforts, NGOs advocacy and our church engagement to facilitate public conversations in health. The initiatives accelerate the work which target smoking, alcohol use, unhealthy eating, sedentary lifestyle, reducing physical activity, and the additional one on the relearning of deep breathing when challenges get too stressful. The duties to improve health care systems are the other chapters for all of us to write. Naturally, you in New Zealand will have no problem. Your infrastructures and health facilities are modern and well resourced. Your workforces are well remunerated and looked after with different incentives that keep you all very loyal. When you get back, when you get sick, you are guaranteed the best care 
But what of the Pacific island and Samoa, for example? Like my country, Samoa, the Pacific island countries are grappling with the small island vulnerability issues. Increasing environmental and climate changes which are threatening our ethnic groups, their land, culture, and identities. Health concerns remain a priority. Non-communicable diseases are a cause of panic, whilst at the same time trying to manage the communicable disease burden. The double burden of communicable disease and non-communicable diseases is the reality in nearly all the Pacific Island countries. Most are forced with the challenges to work on health system strengthening. Continuing shortage of health workforce is any, any minister of health's pain. The migration of health workers to the developed world like this country is not new and has continued to leave a gap in any health system. Samoa works very hard on its institutional training of nurses, midwives, and allied health professionals. The Oceania University of Medicine is Samoa's long-term vision for the training and future recruitment of medical doctors. We envisage an increase of the medical fraternity by 2020, and Samoa will have eased its workforce problems. Health technology and health information systems are important building blocks in health system strengthening that Samoa and Pacific Island countries have to consistently work to improve. Health financing is a consistent major challenge. The cost of national treatments are peaking and most Pacific Island countries are being severely burdened by the costs of overseas treatments. Like for example, in Samoa, the annual budget allocated for overseas treatment alone has tripled in the last five years, but only 0.002% of the total population of 182,000 get referred for overseas treatment, mostly in New Zealand. So if we analyze this according to the equity principle, then I will leave you to do the mathematics. Naturally, all this impact on healthcare. Whilst we are still heavily dependent on donor funding for health promotion and prevention costs, government at, at least is embracing its responsibilities in health services. Health and education have been Samoa's priority for the past decades. Government has tried to be true to its governance duties in supporting the health sector and the healthcare system. A new hospital is being built by the People's Republic of China. Equipments and machineries for the new hospital are assisted by the Australian and New Zealand governments. Health promotion is making lead ways and the proposed establishment of a National Health Promotion Foundation to champion the health focus system is aimed to be launched by July 2013. Most Pacific Island countries have national strategic plans and plan of action which they follow to address health concerns. Samoa is no different. And no matter how many any country has, healthcare is and will always be expensive. The revitalization of primary health care and the Healthy Islands philosophies are the most appropriate health services for us. 
There is no question about this. They have served as well towards the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, and they will also ensure sustainable health services. Samoa's response to all our health concerns is driven by advocating health in all policies and my work on facilitating political commitment. The two are the sure ways to make a difference in health. Ladies and gentlemen, I decided to briefly include in my talk the high-level meeting in New York on September 2011. Heads of governments met and agreed on a United Nations political declaration on non-communicable disease prevention and control. I am mindful that this may be old information for some of you. However, I am uplifted by the fact that I was one of the government leaders involved and the inclusion of non-communicable disease in the 2011 United Nations General Assembly agenda had major significance on us in the small Pacific Island countries. This was only the second time that a health agenda was discussed by the United Nations General Assembly. HIV, AIDS, prevention and control was the first and only one ever that made it to the United Nations General Assembly agenda. Years of advocacy for non-communicable disease as a global health concern finally paid off when the United Nations Declaration was endorsed. This decision by world leaders mean more country level assistance for us on the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. The United Nations Political Declaration, ladies and gentlemen, is in many ways a safeguard for our children in the future, and a high-level commitment to ending inequity affecting the vulnerable and minority groups. The political declaration in brief is when world leaders at the United Nations General Assembly on September 2011 acknowledged that the global burden and threat of non-communicable diseases constitutes one of the major challenges for development in the 21st century, which undermines social and economic development throughout the world and threatens the achievement of internationally agreed development goals. There was genuine recognition of how increasing NCD would perpetuate inequalities and vulnerability among people of developing countries. The primary role of governments in responding to the challenges posed by non-communicable diseases was unanimously acknowledged. As one of the country leaders at the United Nations high-level meeting, I appreciated the global mandate through this declaration for any government, especially the ministers of health, who are expected to champion implementation. Like most developments in our small Pacific Island countries, we cannot do this alone. We need the assistance of our development partners and the international community, especially now when globalization has made its mark and WTO agreement has its own national responsibilities. At least for us in health, the United Nations Political Declaration on Non-Communicable Diseases, Prevention and Control can be exploited for health agendas. World leaders at the United Nations high-level meeting also reaffirmed the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. They also recognize the urgent need for greater measures at global, regional, 
and national levels to prevent and control NCDs in order to contribute to the full realization of the right of everyone to the highest attainable standard of physical health and mental health. One thing is clear, ladies and gentlemen, was NCD is a challenge of epidemic proportions and its social economic and development impacts great. They are indeed amongst the leading causes of preventable morbidity and of related disability in most countries, Samoa included. The challenge, of course, is for governments to respond accordingly. A United Nations political, political declaration practically giving back the onus of responsibility to governing bodies in countries to champion whole of country and whole of government initiatives to strengthen multi-sectoral collaboration in order to address and do something about NCDs. Like all United Nations declarations, governments are now forced to account for the NCD situation of their population to the United Nations. There are monitoring and reporting obligations and the ministers of health on behalf of governments are expected to ascertain appropriate country mechanisms to strengthen the implementation of NCD prevention and control. The government of Samoa's cabinet has already endorsed the domestication of this declaration and I have ensured that my colleagues in parliament are aware of its contents and focus. I have drawn their attention to political duties and my parliamentary colleagues are advised of this declaration through the initial advocacy that I have spearheaded through Sparkle members. Sparkle is a parliamentary advocacy group for healthy living that is chaired by the Speaker of the House of Parliament of Samoa. Four cabinet ministers are included, five associate ministers, five members of the opposition, including the, the opposition leader, and selected heads of ministries. The term of reference is deliberately uh, health in all policies focused, and I have worked diligently to make the United Nations political declaration on NCD as their health platform to champion what is for me an example of demonstrating political will. In concluding, I must say that I have listened intently to the wealth of information and the presentations since I arrived in New Zealand for this conference. And I, after three days of listening to the different issues of Maori and uh, New Zealand Pacific Island children, I cannot help but wonder how the principles of universal access, equity, and affordability are applied for these children's health. I am genuinely bothered by the evidence shown yesterday evening by the Children's Commissioner on the Pacific Island children's health status. The differing st statistics on the health of ethnic children living in New Zealand is a picture of inequity, poverty, and abuse. What are the public health professionals of Maori and Pacific Island descent doing about these stark figures? The assertion by the executive director of the Ririki program 
about the growing population of brown underclass children who are Maori and New Zealand Pacific Islanders was also frightening. I hope that at the end of this conference, some of the solutions will be found to address these issues. It is a big challenge, but as it has already been said many times since the beginning of this conference, there are solutions. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. So, you're welcome.